Hello, hello, welcome back to another section of The Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls. Very excited to be back with another section for you guys. I was in Ireland this last week um, and very grateful for all the experiences I had there, but equally excited to jump back into our next section of this read. Um, we're on section seven. So it's like day seven. Um, and we're starting with the Duchess chapter on page 179. Hope you guys are liking this book so far. We're getting like, I'd say we're about like the one third mark here. So, you know, we've gotten a little bit, a little bit done. And if you are liking it, give me a thumb, subscribe so you can catch the rest, you know, all that jazz. But let's get going. Page 179, and this is a Duchess chapter. It's a map, exclaimed Wooly in surprise. So it is. We were sitting in a booth at the Hojo's waiting for our breakfast. In front of each of us was a paper placemat that was also a simplified map of the state of Illinois showing major roads and towns along with some out-of-scale illustrations of regional landmarks. In addition, there were 16 Howard Johnsons, each with its little orange roof and little blue steeple. This is where we are, Wooly said, pointing to one of them. I'll take your word for it. And here's the Lincoln Highway. And look at this. Before I could look over to see what this was, our waitress, who couldn't have been more than 17, set our plates down on top of our placements. Wooly frowned. After watching her retreat, he nudged his plate to the right so that he could continue studying the map while he pretended to eat. It was ironic to see how little attention Wooly paid to his breakfast, given how much attention he paid to ordering it. When our waitress had handed him the menu, he looked a little unnerved by its size. Taking a breath, he set about reading the descriptions of every single item out loud. Then, to make sure he hadn't missed anything, he went back to the beginning and read them again. When our waitress returned to take our order, he reported with self-assurance that he was going to have waffles, or make that scrambled eggs, only to switch to the hotcakes when she was turning to go. But when his hotcakes arrived, having decorated them with an elaborate spiral of syrup, Wooly ignored them at his bacon's expense. I, on the other hand, who hadn't even bothered to glance at the menu, made quick business of my corned, corned beef hash and sunny side ups. Having cleaned my plate, I sat back and took a look around, thinking if Wooly wanted to get a sense of what my restaurant was going to be like, he needed look no further than Howard Johnson's, because in every respect, it was going to be the opposite. From the standpoint of ambiance, the good people at Howard Johnson's had decided to carry the colors of their well-known rooftop into the restaurant by dressing the booths in bright orange and the waitresses in bright blue, despite the fact that the combination of orange and blue hasn't been known to stimulate an appetite since the beginning of time. The definitive architectural element of the space was an uninterrupted chain of picture windows which gave everyone an unimpeded view of the parking lot. The cuisine was a gussied up version of what you'd find in a diner, and the defining characteristic of a clientele was that, with a single glance, you could tell more about them than you wanted to know. Take the red-faced fellow in the next booth who was wiping up his yolk with a corner of whole wheat toast. A traveling salesman, if ever I saw one, and I've seen a lifetime supply. On the family tree of unmemorable middle-aged men, traveling salesmen are the first cousins of the has-been performers. They go to the same towns in the same cars and stay at the same hotels. In fact, the only way you can tell them apart is that the salesmen wear more sensible shoes. As if I needed any proof, after watching him use his command of percentages to tally his waitress's tip, I saw him annotate the receipt, fold it in two, and stow it in his wallet for the boys back in accounting. As the salesman stood to go, I noticed from the clock on the wall that it was already half past seven. Wooly, I said, the whole point of getting up early is to take an early start. So why don't you tackle some of those hotcakes while I go to the john? Then we can pay the bill and hit the road. Sure thing, said Wooly, while pushing his plate 
another few inches to the right. Before going to the men's room, I got some change of the cashier and slipped into a phone booth. I knew that Ackerley had retired to Indiana. I just didn't know where. So I had the operator look up the number for Selena and put me through. Given the hour, it rang eight times before someone finally answered. I think it was Lucinda, the brunette with the pink glasses who guarded the warden's door. Taking a page from my father's book, I gave her the old King Lear. That's what my father would use whenever he needed a little help from someone on the other end of the line. Naturally, it entailed a British accent, but with a touch of befuddlement. Explaining that I was Ackerley's uncle from England, I told her that I wanted to send him a card on Independence Day in order to assure him there were no hard feelings, but I seemed to have misplaced my address book. Was there any way she could see to helping a forgetful old soul? A minute later, she returned with the answer. 132 Rhododendron Road in South Bend. With a whistle on my lips, I traveled from the phone booth to the men's room, and who should I find standing at the urinals but the red-faced fellow from the neighboring booth? When I finished doing my business and joined him at the sinks, I gave him a quick smile in the mirror. You, sir, strike me as a salesman. A little impressed, he looked back at me in the reflection. I am in sales. I nodded my head. You've got that friendly man of the world look about you. Why, thanks. Door to door? No, he said, a little offended. I'm an account man. Of course you are. In what line, if you don't mind me asking? Kitchen appliances. Like refrigerators and dishwashers? He winced a little as if I'd hit a sore spot. We specialize in the smaller electronic conveniences like blenders and hand mixers. Mm, small but essential, I pointed out. Oh yes, indeed. So, tell me, how do you do it? When you go into an account, I mean, how do you make a sale? Of your blender, for instance. Our blender sells itself. From the way he delivered the line, I could tell that he had done so 10,000 times before. You're too modest, I'm sure, but seriously, when you speak of your blender versus the com competitions, how do you differentiate it? At the word differentiate, he grew rather grave and confidential. Never mind that he was talking to an 18-year-old kid in the bathroom of a Howard Johnson's. He was gearing up for the pitch now and couldn't stop himself even if he wanted to. I was only half kidding, he began, when I remarked that our blender sells itself. Because, you see, it wasn't so long ago that all the leading blenders came with three settings, low, medium, and high. Our company was the first to differentiate its blender buttons by the type of blending. Mix, beat, and whip. Ingenious! You must have the market to yourself. For a time we did, he admitted. But soon enough, our competitors were following suit. So you've got to keep one step ahead. Precisely. That's why this year I'm proud to say we became the first blender manufacturer in America to introduce a fourth stage of blending. A fourth stage? After mixed beat and whip? The suspense was killing me. Puree. Bravo, I said. And in a way... I meant it. I gave him another once-over, this one in admiration. Then I asked him if he had fought in the war. I didn't have the honor of doing so, he said, also for the ten thousandth, ten thousandth time. I shook my head in sympathy. What a hoopla when the boys came home. Fireworks and parades. Mayors pinning medals on lapels and all the good-looking dames lining up to kit kiss any putts in a uniform. But do you know what I think? I think the American people should pay a little more homage to the traveling salesman. I couldn't tell if I was having him on or not. So I put a, put a hint of emotion into my voice. My father was a traveling salesman. Oh, the miles he logged. The doorbells he rang, the nights he spent far from the comforts of home. I say to you that the traveling salesmen are not simply hard-working men. They are the foot soldiers of capitalism. I think he actually blushed at that one. 
though it was hard to tell, given his complexion. It is an honor to meet you, sir, I said, and I stuck out my hand, even though I hadn't dried it yet. When I came out of the bathroom, I saw our waitress and flagged her down. Do you need something else? She asked. Just a check, I replied. We've got places to go and people to see. At the phrase, places to go, she looked a little wistful. I do believe if I had told her we were heading for New York and offered her a ride, she would have hopped into the back seat without taking the time to change out of her uniform, if for no other reason than to see what happens when you drive off the edge of the placement. I'll bring it right over, she said. As I headed to our booth, I regretted making fun of our neighbor for his attention to receipts, because it suddenly occurred to me that we should be doing something similar on Emmett's behalf. Since we were using the money from his envelope to cover our expenses, he had every right to expect a full accounting upon our return so that he could be reimbursed before we divvied up the trust. The night before, I'd left Wooly to pay the dinner bill while I checked into the hotel. I was going to ask him how much it ended up costing, but when I got to our booth, there was no Wooly. Where could he have gotten to? I wondered. With a roll of the eyes... He couldn't be in the bathroom, since that's where I had just come from. Knowing him to be an admirer of shiny and colorful things, I looked over at the ice cream counter, but there were just two little kids pressing their noses against the glass, wishing it wasn't so early in the morning. With a growing sense of foreboding, I turned to the plate glass windows. Out, I looked into the parking lot, moving my gaze across the shimmering sea of glass and chrome, to the very spot in which I had parked the Studebaker, and in which the Studebaker was no longer. Taking a step to my right in order to see around a pair of beehive hairdos, I looked toward the parking lot's entrance just in time to see Emmett's car taking a right onto the Lincoln Highway. Jesus fucking shitting Christ! Our waitress, who happened to arrive with the check at that very moment, turned pale. Excuse my French, I said. Then, glancing at the check, I gave her a 20 from the envelope. As she hurried off for the change, I slumped down in my seat and stared across the table to where Willie should have been. On his plate, which was back where it had started, the bacon was gone, along with a narrow wedge of hotcakes. As I was admiring the precision with which Willie had removed such a slender little slice from the stack, I noticed that under the white ceramic of his plate was the formica surface of the table, which is to say, the placemat was gone. Shoving my plate aside, I picked up my own placemat. As, as I said before, it was a map of Illinois, with major roads and towns. But in the lower right-hand corner, there was an inset with a map of the local downtown area, at the center of which was a little green square, and rising from the middle of that little green square, looking as large as life, was a statue of Abraham Lincoln. Page 186, chapter from Wooly. Hum de dum de dum Wooly hummed as he took another look at the map in his lap. Performance is sweeter. Nothing can beat her. Life is completer. Oh, hum de dum de dum Get off the road! Someone yelled as they passed the Studebaker with a triple honk of the horn. Oh, apologies, 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 replied Wooly in a reciprocal triplicate with a friendly wave of the hand. As he angled back into his lane, Wooly acknowledged that it probably wasn't advisable to drive with a map in your lap with what with all the looking up and down. So, keeping the steering wheel in his left hand and the map in his right hand, that way he could look at the map out of one eye and the road out of the other. The day before, when Duchess had secured the Phillips 66 road map of America at the Phillips, Phillips 66 gas station, he handed it to Wooly, saying that since he was driving, Wooly would have to navigate. Wooly had accepted this responsibility with a touch of unease. When a gas station map is handed to you, it's almost the perfect size, like a playbill at the theater. But in order to read a gas station map, you have to unfold and unfold and unfold it until the Pacific Ocean is up against the gear shift and the Atlantic Ocean is lapping at the passenger side door. 
Once a gas station map is open all the way, just the sight of it is likely to make you woozy because it is pos postu positively crisscrossed from top to bottom and side to side by highways and byways and a thousand little roads, each of which is marked with a tiny little name or tiny little number. It reminded Wooly of the textbook for a biology class that he had taken while at St. Paul's, or was it St. Mark's? Either way, early in this volume, on the left-hand page was a picture of a human skeleton. After looking carefully at this skeleton with all the various bones in their proper places, when you turned to the next page, fully expecting the skeleton to appear, the skeleton was still there, because the next page was made of see-through paper. It was made of see-through paper so that you could study the nervous system right on top of the skeleton. And when you turned the page after that, you could study the skeleton, the nervous system, and the circulatory system with all of its little blue and red lines. Wooly knew that this multi-layered illustration was meant to make things perfectly clear, but he found it very unnerving. Was it a picture of a man or a woman, for instance, old or young, black or white? And how did all the blood cells and nerve impulses that were traveling along these complicated networks know where they were supposed to go? And once they got there, how did they find their way home? That's what the Phillips 66 roadmap was like. An illustration with hundreds of arteries, veins, and capillaries branching ever outward until no traveling along any one of them could possibly know where they were going. But this was hardly the case with the place map map from Howard Johnson's. It didn't have to be unfolded at all, and it wasn't covered with a confusion of highways and byways. It had exactly the right amount of roads. And those that were named were named clearly, while those that weren't named clearly weren't named at all. The other highly commendable characteristic of the Howard Johnson's map was the illustrations. Most map makers are particularly good at shrinking things. The states, the towns, the rivers, the roads, every single one of them is shrunk to a smaller dimension. But on the Howard Johnson's place map, after reducing the towns, rivers, and roads, the map maker added back a, se a selection of illustrations that were bigger than they were supposed to be, like a big scarecrow in the lower left-hand corner that showed you where the cornfields were, or the big tiger at in the upper right-hand corner that showed you the Lincoln Park Zoo. It was just the way the pirates used to draw their treasure maps. They shrunk down the ocean and the islands until they were very small and simple. But then they added back a big, big ship off the coast and a big palm tree on the beach and a big rock formation on the hill that was in the shape of a skull and was exactly 15 paces from the X that marked the spot. In the box that was in the lower right-hand corner of the placemat, there was a map within the map, which showed the center of town. According to this map, if you took a right on 2nd Street and drove an inch and a half, you would arrive at Liberty Park, in the middle of which would be a great big statue of Abraham Lincoln. Suddenly, out of his left eye, Wooly saw the sign for 2nd Street. Without a moment to spare, he took a sharp right turn to the tune of another honking horn. Apologies, he called. Leaning toward the windshield, he caught a glimpse of greenery. Here we go, he said. Here we go. A minute later, he was there. Pulling to the curb, he opened his door and it was nearly taken off by a passing sedan. Whoops! Closing the door, Wooly scooched over the seat, climbed the passenger side, waiting for a break in, climbed out the passenger side, waiting for a break in traffic, and dashed across the street. In the park, it was a bright and sunny day. The trees were in leaf, the bushes in bloom, and the daisies sprouting up on both sides of the path. Here we go, he said again, as he went zipping along. But 
Suddenly, the daisy-lined path was intersected by another path, presenting Wooly with three different options to go. Go left, go right, go straight ahead. Wishing he'd thought to bring the pla placemat map, Wooly looked in each direction. To his left were trees and shrubs and dark green benches. To his right were more trees, shrubs, and benches, as well as a man in a baggy suit and floppy hat who looked vaguely familiar. But straight ahead, if Wooly squinted, he could just make out a fountain. Aha! he shouted. For in Wooly's experience, statues were often found in the vicinity of fountains. Like the statue of Garibaldi that was near the fountain in Washington Square Park, or the statue of the angel on top of that big fountain in Central Park. With heightened confidence, Wooly ran to the lip of the fountain and paused in the refreshing mist to get his bearings. What he discovered from a quick survey was that the fountain was an epicenter from which eight different paths emanated, if you included the one that he just comes in along. Fending off discouragement, Willie slowly began working his way clockwise, uh, clockwise around the fountain's circumference, peering down each of the individual paths with a hand over his eyes like Captain at sea. And there, at the end of the sixth path, path was Honest Abe himself. Rather than zip down this path, out of respect for the statue, Wooly walked in long Link Lincolnian strides until he came to a stop a few feet away. What a wonderful likeness, thought Wooly, not only did it capture the president's stature, it seemed to suggest his moral courage. While for the most part, this Lincoln was depicted as one might expect with his Shenandoah beard and his long black coat, the sculptor had made one unusual choice. In his right hand, the president was holding his hat lightly by the brim, as if he had just removed it upon meeting an acquaintance in the street. Taking a seat on a bench in front of the statue, Wooly turned his thoughts to the day before when Billy was explaining the history of the Lincoln Highway in the back of Emmett's car. Billy had mentioned that when it was first being constructed in 19-something, enthusiasts had painted red, white, and blue stripes on barns and fence posts all along the route. Wooly could picture this perfectly because it reminded him of how on the 4th of July his family would hang red, white, and blue streamers from the rafters of the great room and the rails of the porch. Oh, how his great-grandfather had loved the 4th of July. On Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter, Wooly's great-grandfather hadn't cared whether his children chose to celebrate the holiday with him or went off to celebrate with anybody else. But when it came to Independence Day, he did not abide absenteeism. He made it perfectly clear that every child, grandchild, and great-grandchild was expected in the Adirondacks no matter how far they had to travel. And gather they did. On the 1st of July, family members would start to pull up in the driveway or arrive at the train station or land at the little airstrip that was 20 miles away. But the afternoon of the second, every sleeping spot in the house was taken, with the grandparents, uncles, and aunts in the bedrooms, the younger cousins on the sleeping porch, and all the cousins who were lucky enough to be older than 12 in the tents among the pines. When the fourth arrived, there was a picnic lunch on the lawn, followed by canoe races, swim races, the riflery and anchory contests, and a great big game of capture the flag. At six o'clock on the dot, there were cocktails on the porch. At half past seven, the bell would be rung and everyone would make their way inside for supper fried chicken, corn on the cob, and Dorothy's fam famous blueberry muffins. Then at 10, Uncle Bob and Uncle Randy would row out to the raft in the middle of the lake in order to launch the fireworks that they had bought in Pennsylvania. How Billy would have loved it, thought Wooly with a smile. 
He would have loved the streamers on the fence rail and the tents among the trees and the baskets of blueberry muffins. But most of all, he would have loved the fireworks, which always started with whistles and pops, but would grow bigger and bigger until they seemed to fill the sky. But even as Wooly was having this wonderful memory, his expression grew somber, for he had almost forgotten what his mother would refer to as the reason we're all here, the recitations. Every year on the 4th of July, once all the food had been set out, in lieu of Grace, the youngest child or older than 16, would take his or her place at the head of the table and recite from the Declaration of Independence. When, in the course of human events, and we hold these truths to be self-evident, and so forth. But, as Woolley's great-grandfather liked to observe, if Messrs. Washington, Jefferson, and Adams had the vision to found the Republic, it was Mr. Lincoln who had the courage to perfect it. So, when the cousin who had recited from the Declaration had resumed his or her seat, the youngest child older than ten would take his or her place at the head of the table in order to recite the Gettysburg Address in its entirety. When that was completed, the speaker would take a bow and the room would erupt into an ovation that was almost as loud as the one that followed the finale of the fireworks. Then the platters and baskets would go zipping around the table to the sound of laughter and good cheer. It was a moment that Wooly always looked forward to. Looked forward to, that is, until the 16th of March, 1944, the day that he turned 10. Right after his mother and sisters had sung happy birthday on his behalf, his oldest sister, Caitlin, had felt it necessary to note that come the 4th of July, it would be Wooly's turn to stand at the head of the table. Wooly was so unnerved by this bit of news that he could barely finish his piece of chocolate cake. Because if Wooly knew anything by the age of ten, it was that he wasn't any good at rememorizing. Sensing Wooly's concern, his sister Sarah, who seven years before had given a flawless recitation, offered to serve as his coach. Memorizing the address is well within your grasp, she said to Wooly with a smile. After all, it's only ten sentences. Initially, this assured uh, this assurance heartened Wooly, but when his sister showed him the actual text of the speech, Wooly discovered that while at first glance it might seem to be only ten sentences, the very last line was actually three different sentences disguised as one. For all intents and purposes, as Wooly used to say, there are twelve sentences, not ten. Even so, Sarah replied. But just to be sure, she, she suggested they start their preparation well in advance. In the first week of April, Wooly would learn to recite the first sentence word for word. Then in the second week of April, he would learn the first and second sentences. Then in the third week, the first three sentences, and so on until 12 weeks later, just as the month of June was drawing to a close, Wooly would be able to recite the entire speech without a hitch. And that's exactly how they prepared. Week by week, Wooly learned one sentence after another until he could recite the speech in its entirety. In fact, by the 1st of July, he had recited it from beginning to end, not only in front of Sarah, but by himself in front of the mirror at the kitchen sink while helping Dorothy do the dishes, and once in a canoe in the middle of the lake. So, when the fateful day arrived, Wooly was ready. After his cousin Edward had recited from the De Declaration of Independence and received a friendly round of applause, Wooly assumed the privileged spot. But just as he was about to begin, he discovered the first problem with his sister's plan. The people. For while Wooly had recited the address many times in front of his sister and often by himself, he had never recited it in front of anybody else. And this wasn't even anybody else. It was 30 of his closest relatives lined up on opposite sides of a table in two attentive rows, with none other than his great-grandfather seated at the opposite end. Casting a glance at Sarah, 
Willie received a nod of encouragement, which bolstered his confidence. But just as he was about to begin, Willie discovered the second problem with his sister, sister's plan, the attire. For while Willie had previously recited the address in his corduroys, his pajamas, and his bathing suit, not once had he recited it in an itchy blue blazer with a red and white tie gripping at his throat. As Wooly pulled at his collar with a crooked finger, some of his younger cousins began to giggle. Shh, said his grandmother. Wooly looked back to Sarah, who gave him another friendly nod. Go ahead, she said. Just as she had taught Wooly, stood up straight, took two deep breaths, and began. Four score and seven years, he said. Four score and seven years ago, there was more sniggering from the younger cousins, followed by another shush from his grandmother. Remembering that Sarah had said if he got nervous, he should look over the heads of the family. Willie raised his eyes to the moose head on the wall, but finding the gaze of the moose unsympathetic, he tried instead looking at his shoes. Four score four and seven years ago, he began again. Our fathers brought forth, Sarah softly prompted. Our fathers brought forth, Willie said, looking up at his sister. Our fathers brought forth on this countenance, on this continent, on this continent, a new nation. A new nation conceived in liberty, said a friendly voice. Only it wasn't Sarah's voice. It was the voice of Cousin James, who had graduated from Princeton a few weeks before. And this time, when Willie renewed his recital, Sarah and James joined in. Conceived in liberty, the three of them said together, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Then... Other, other relatives, who in their time had been tasked with reciting Mr. Lincoln's address, added their voices. Then, joining the chorus, were members of the family who had never been required to recite the address, but who had heard it so many times before that they, too, knew it by heart. Soon, everyone at the table, including Great Grandpa, was reciting, and when all together they said those grand and hopeful words that... The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The family burst into a round of cheering like the room had never heard. Surely, this was the way that Abraham Lincoln had meant his address to be recited. Not as a little boy standing alone at the head of a table in an itchy coat, but as four generations of family speaking together in unison. Oh, if only his father could have been there, thought Wooly, wiping a tear from his cheek with the flat of his hand. If only his father could be here now. After Wooly had battled away the blues and finished paying his respects to the president, he went back the way he'd come. This time, when he reached the fountain, he was careful to walk counterclockwise around its circumference until he reached the sixth path. No path looks quite the same in both directions, so as Willie progressed, he began to wonder if he'd made a mistake. Perhaps he had miscounted the number of paths when he had counterclockwise to the fountain, but just as he was considering retracing his steps, he saw the man in the floppy hat. When Willie gave him the smile of recognition, the man gave him the smile of recognition back. But when Willie gave him a little wave, the man didn't return it. Instead, he reached into the baggy pockets of his baggy jacket. Then he formed a circle with his arms by placing the fist of his right hand on his left shoulder and the fist of his left hand on his right shoulder. Intrigued, Willie watched as the man began moving his hands down the length of the opposing arms, leaving little white objects at every consecutive inch. It's popcorn, Willie said in amazement. 
one of the pieces of popcorn extended from the top of his shoulders down to the top of his wrists. Ever so slowly, the man began to open his arms until they were stretching out at his sides like, like, like a scarecrow, Willie realized. That's why the man in the floppy hat had seemed so familiar, because he looked exactly like the scarecrow in the bottom left-hand corner of the placed map map. Only, this man wasn't a scarecrow. He was the opposite of a scarecrow. For once his arms were fully extended, all the little sparrows which had been milling about began to flutter in the air and hover near his arms. As the sparrows pecked at the popcorn, two squirrels that had been hiding under a bench scurried to the gentleman's feet. His eyes wide, Wooly thought for a moment that they were going to climb him like a tree. But the squirrels, who knew their business, waited for the sparrows to knock the occasional piece of popcorn from the gentleman's arms to the ground. I must remember to tell Duchess about all this, thought Wooly as he hurried along. For the bird man of Liberty Park seemed just like one of those old vaudevillians that Duchess liked to tell them about. But as Wooly emerged onto the street, the joyful image of the bird man standing with his arms outstretched was replaced by the much less joyful image of a police officer standing behind Emmett's car with a ticket book in hand. That's the end of Willie's chapter. We'll do one more, page 197, a chapter from Emmett. Emmett woke with a vague awareness that the train was no longer moving. Glancing at Billy's watch, he could see it was shortly after eight. They must have already reached Cedar Rapids. Quietly, so as not to wake his brother, Emmett rose, climbed the ladder, and stuck his head through the hatch in the roof. Looking back, he could see that the train, which was now on a siding, had been lengthened by at least twenty cars. Standing on the ladder, his face exposed to the cool morning air, Emmett was no longer stirred by thoughts of the past. What stirred him now was hunger. All he had eaten since leaving Morgan was the sandwich his brother had gave him in the station. Billy, at least, had had the good sense to eat breakfast at the orphanage when it was offered to him. By Emmett's estimation, they still had another 30 hours before reaching New York, and all they had in Billy's backpack was a canteen of water and the last of Sally's cookies. But when the panhandler had told Emmett that they would stop for a few hours on a private siding outside of Cedar Rapids, he'd said it was so that General Mills could hitch some of their cars to the back of the truck. Cars stacked from floor to ceiling with boxes of cereal. Emmett went down the ladder and gently woke his brother. The train's going to be stopped here for a bit, Billy. I'm going to see if I can find us something to eat. Okay, Emmett. As Billy went back to sleep, Emmett climbed up the ladder and out the hatch. Seeing no signs of life up or down the line, he began working his way to the rear of the train. As the General Mills cars were laden, Emmett knew that they were likely to be locked. He simply had to hope that one of the hatches had been left unsecured inadvertently. Figuring he had less than an hour before they were underway, he moved as quickly as he could, leaping from one, the top of one boxcar to the next. But when he reached the last of the empty Nabisco cars, he came to a stop. While he could see the flat rectangular tops of the General Mills car stretching into the distance, the two that were immediately in front of him had the curved rooftops of passenger cars. After a moment's hesitation, Emmett climbed down onto the narrow platform and peered through the small window in the door. Most of the interior was obscured by the curtains that bordered the inside of the window, but what little Emmett could see was promising. It appeared to be the sitting room of a well-appointed private car after a night of festivities. Beyond a pair of high back chairs with their backs to him, Emmett could see a coffee table covered with empty glasses, empty glasses, a champagne bottle upside down in an ice bucket, and a small buffet on which were the remnants of a meal. The passengers were presumably in the sleeping compartments of the adjacent car. Opening the door, Emmett quietly stepped inside. As he took his bearings, he could see that what 
festivities there had been had left the room in disarray. Strewn across the floor were feathers from a busted pillow along with bread rolls and grapes as if they'd been used in ammunition in a fight. The glass front of a grandfather clock was open, the hands missing from its face, and sound asleep on a couch by the buffet was a man in his mid-twenties wearing a soiled tuxedo and the bright red stripes of an Apache on his cheeks. Emmett considered backing out of the car and continued over the roof, but he wasn't going to get a better chance than this. Keeping his eyes on the sleeping figure, Emmett passed between the high back chairs and advanced cautiously. On the buffet were a bowl of fruit, loaves of bread, hunks of cheese, and a half-eaten ham. There was also an overturned jar of ketchup, no doubt the source of the war paint. At his feet, Emmett found the case of the busted pillow. Loading it quickly with enough food for two days, he spun it around the neck, around by the neck to cinch it. Then he took one last look at the sleeper and turned toward the door. Oh, steward! Slumped in one of the high back chairs was a second man in a tuxedo. With his attention trained on the sleeper, Emmett had walked right by this one without noticing him which was all the more surprising given his size. He must have been nearly six feet tall and 200 pounds. He wasn't wearing war paint, but he had a slice of ham sticking neatly out of his breast pocket as if it were a handkerchief. With the eyes half, his eyes half open, the reveler raised a hand and slowly unfolded a finger in order to point at something on the floor. If you would be so kind, looking in the indicated direction, Emmett saw a half-empty bottle of gin lying on its side. Setting down the pillowcase, Emmett retrieved the gin and handed it to the reveler, who received it with a sigh. For the better part of an hour, I've had my eye on this bottle, sorting through the various stratagems by which it might be delivered into my possession. One by one, I had to discard them as ill-conceived, ill-advised, or defying the laws of gravity. Eventually, I turn to the last course of a man who wants something done and who has exhausted every option short of doing it himself, which is to say, I prayed. I prayed to Ferdinand and Bartholomew, the patron, patron saints of Pullman cards and toppled bottles, and an angel of mercy hath descended upon me. Looking to Emmett with a grateful smile, he suddenly expressed surprise. You aren't the steward. I'm one of the brakemen, said Emmett. My thanks all the same. Turning to his left, the reveler picked up a martini glass that was on a small round table and began carefully filling it with gin. As he did so, Emmett noted that the olive in the bottom of the glass had been speared with the minute hand of the clock. Having filled the glass, the reveler looked to Emmett. Could I interest you? No, thank you. On duty, I suppose. Raising his drink briefly toward Emmett, he emptied the glass at a toss, then considered it ruefully. You were wise to decline. This gin is unnaturally tepid. Criminally so, you might say. Nonetheless, refilling the glass, he raised it once again to his lips, but this time stopped short with a look of concern. You wouldn't happen to know where we are. Outside Cedar Rapids. Iowa? Yes. And the time? About half past eight. In the morning? Yes, said Emmett, in the morning. The reveler began to tilt his glass, but stopped again. Not Thursday morning? No, said Emmett, trying to contain his impatience. It's Tuesday. The reveler exhaled in relief, then leaned toward the man who was sleeping on the couch. Did you hear that, Mr. Packer? When Packer didn't respond, the reveler set down his glass, took a bread roll from a jacket pocket, and threw it at Packer's head accurately. I say, did you hear that? Hear what, Mr. Parker? It's not Thursday yet. 
Rolling onto his side, Packer faced the wall. Wednesday's child is full of woe, but Thursday's child has far to go. Parker stared at his companion thoughtfully, then leaned toward Emmett. Between us, Mr. Packer is also unnaturally tepid. I heard that, said Packer to the wall. Parker ignored him and continued confiding in Emmett. Normally, I am not one to fret over such things as the day of the week, but Mr. Packer and I are bound by a sacred trust. For sound asleep in the next cabin is none other than Alexander Cunningham the Third, the beloved grandson of the owner of this delightful car. And we have vowed that we will have Mr. Cunningham back in Chicago by at the doors of the racket club. That's racket with a Q, mind you, by Thursday night at six, so we can deliver him safely into the hands of his captors, said Packer. Into the hands of his bride-to-be, corrected Parker, which is a duty not to be taken lightly, Mr. Brakeman, for Mr. Cunningham's grandfather is the largest operator of refrigerated boxcars in America. And the bride's grandfather is the largest producer of sausage links. So I think you can see the importance of our getting Mr. Cunningham to Chicago on time. The future of breakfast in America depends on it, said Packer. Indeed it does, agreed Parker. Indeed it does. Emmett was raised to hold no man in disdain. To hold another man in disdain, his father would say, presumed that you knew so much about his lot, so much about his intentions, about his actions, both public and private, that you could rank his character against your own without fear of misjudgment. But as he watched the one called Parker empty another glass of tepid gin and then draw the olive off the minute hand with his teeth, Emmett couldn't help but measure the man and find him wanting. Back in Selena... One of the stories that Duchess liked to tell when they were working in the fields or biding time in the barracks was about a performer who called himself Professor Heinrich Schweitzer, master of telekinesis. When the curtain rose on the professor, he would be sitting in the middle of the stage at a small table with a white tablecloth, a single dinner setting and an unlit candle. From offstage, a waiter would appear, serve the professor a steak, pour a glass of wine, and light the candle. When the waiter left, in an unhurried manner, the professor would eat some of the steak, drink some of the wine, and stick his fork upright in the meat, all without saying a word. After wiping his lips with his napkin, he would hold a parted thumb and finger in the air. As he slowly closed them together, the flame of the candle would sputter, then expire, leaving a trail of thin trail of smoke. Next, the professor would stare at his wine until it boiled over the rim. When he turned his attention to his plate, the top half of the fork would bend until it was at a 90 degree angle. At this point, the audience, which had been warned to maintain a perfect silence, was rumbling with expressions of amazement or disbelief. With a hand raised, the professor would quiet the house, Closing his eyes, he would point his palms toward the table. As he concentrated, the table would begin to tremble with, to such a degree that you could hear its legs knocking against the surface of the stage. Then, reopening his eyes, the professor would suddenly swipe his hands to the right, and the tablecloth would shoot into the air, leaving the dinner plate, wine glass, and candle undisturbed. The whole act was a hoax, of course. An elaborate illusion achieved through the use of invisible wires, electricity, and jets of air. And Professor Schweitzer? According to Duchess, he was a pole from Poughkeepsie who hadn't enough mastery over telekinesis to drop a hammer on his own foot. No, thought Emmett with a touch of bitterness. The Schweitzers of this world were in no position to move objects with a glance or a wave of the hand. That power was reserved for the Parkers. In all probability, no one had ever told Parker that he had the power of telekinesis, but they hadn't needed to. 
He had learned it through experience, starting from the days of his childhood, when he would demand a toy that was in the window shop or an ice cream from a vendor in the park. Experience had taught him that if he wanted something badly enough, it would eventually be delivered into his hands, even if in defiance of the laws of gravity. With what but disdain can one look upon a man who, in possession of this extraordinary power, uses it to retrieve the remnants of a bottle of gin, gin from across a room without having to get up from his chair? But even as Emmett was having this thought, there was a delicate whirring, and the handless clock began to chime. Glancing at Billy's watch, Emmett saw with a flash of anxiety that it was already nine. He had completely underestimated how much time had passed. The train could be underway at any moment. As Emmett reached for the pillowcase at his feet, Parker shifted his gaze. You're not leaving. I need to get back to the engine. But we are, we're just getting to know one another. Surely there is no rush here. Have a seat. Reaching over, Parker pulled the empty armchair closer to his own, effectively blocking Emmett's path to the door. In the distance, Emmett heard a hiss of steam as the brakes were released and the train began to move. Shoving the empty chair aside, Emmett took a step toward the door. Wait! Parker shouted. Placing his hands on the arms of his chair, he hoisted himself up. Once Parker was standing, Emmett realized he was even larger than he'd seemed. With his head nearly hitting the ceiling of the car, he swayed in place for a moment and lurched forward with his hands extended as if he intended to grab Emmett by the shirt. Emmett felt a surge of adrenaline and the sickening sensation that time was replaying itself for ill. A few feet behind Parker was the coffee table with the empty glasses and the overturned champagne bottle. Given the unsteadiness of Parker's stance, Emmett knew without even thinking that if he gave Parker a single push in the sternum, he could topple him like a tree. It was another opportunity presented by chance for Emmett to upend all of his plans for the future with the action of an instant. But with surprising agility, Parker suddenly slipped a folded $5 bill into the pocket of Emmett's shirt. Then he stepped back and fell into his chair. With the utmost gratitude, Parker called as Emmett went out the door. Gripping the pillowcase in one hand, Emmett scaled the ladder, moved quickly across the length of the box car's roof, and leapt over the gap to the next car, just as he had earlier that morning. Only now, the train was moving, lurching lightly left and right, and it was gaining speed. Emmett guessed it was only traveling at 20 miles an hour, but he had felt the force of the oncoming air when he'd made the jump between the cars. If the train reached 30 miles an hour, he would need to be moving pretty fast to clear the gap. And if it reached 40, he wasn't sure he would be able to clear the gap at all. Emmett began to run. He couldn't remember how many boxcars he had crossed earlier that morning before reaching the Pullman. With a growing sense of urgency, he looked up to see if he could pinpoint the car with the open hatch. What he saw instead was that half a mile ahead, the train was curving over a bend in the tracks. While it was the bend in the tracks that was fixed, and the train that was moving, from Emmett's vantage point, it seemed like it was the bend that was in motion, making its way rapidly down the chain of boxcars, heading toward him inexorably, the way that slack moves along a length of a rope when one end has been whipped. Emmett began to sprint as fast as he could in the hopes of making it to the next boxcar before the curve arrived, but the curve came faster than he anticipated, passing under his feet just as he made the leap. With the boxcar swaying, Emmett landed unevenly and went hurtling forward such that at a moment later he was splayed across the roof with one foot hanging off its edge. Intent on not letting go of the pillowcase, Emmett scrambled to grab something, anything with his free hand. Blindly, he caught hold of a metal lip and pulled himself toward the middle of the roof. Without standing, Emmett eased his way back toward the gap that he'd just leapt across. Finding the ladder with his feet, he slid farther back, climbed down and collapsed on the narrow platform, heaving from the exertion and burning with self-recrimination. What had he been thinking? Jumping from car to car at a sprint, 
He could easily have been thrown from the train. Then what would have happened to Billy? The train was moving at least 50 miles an hour now. At some point in the coming hour, it was sure to slow, but then he would be able to make then he would be able to make his way safely back to their car. Emmett looked down at his brother's watch to log the time, only to find that the crystal was broken and the second hand frozen in place. And that's the end of that chapter from Emmett. Such a strange encounter he had with the Packer and Parker. <laughs> but anywho, we will continue next time on page 206. Hope you enjoyed this section, The Lincoln Highway by Amar Tolls, and I will see you next time. Bye!